We are the Mustache Brothers. Right, really? We're like Mario and Luigi. Really? We're like Beauty and the Beast. Really? We're like um, Daphne and Celeste. I love Daphne and Celeste. They're on a comeback. Hello, I'm Joe. I'm Mark. And this is The Gag Show. So it's a rather beautiful sunny day in Brighton as always. And we have some very exciting stuff going on here today. Yes, it's uh, it's it's the great escape at the moment in Brighton, which is pretty cool. There's loads of music and stuff going on Lots all of over people. the town. Yeah, it's cool. We had our shop repainted actually, red and yellow kaleidoscope stripes for uh, especially for the great escape, which is pretty cool. Plus, it meant we got some delegate passes, so we get to go and check out some things later on. But it's also been a cool week for new stuff. Surprisingly. Indeed, and I can see them down there. Yeah. Some very exciting things from Ormsby. Yeah, this is great. So uh, so at NAM this year, Ormsby announced, or it might have even been slightly before, I think, but at NAM... We saw them at NAM. Yeah, they had yeah. them at NAM. At NAM, Ormsby announced their Goliath GTR series. Now, the, uh, the Goliath range, I think, is something, with that guitar format, is something Ormsby have done from their custom shop, which I think is where everything starts. But the GTR series of Ormsby guitars is their kind of more mass-produced range. They have them done in, in world guitars in, in Korea, which is where like PRS SEs come from, top-end Epiphones, yeah. like uh, loads of cool stuff comes out of there. And Ormsby, I think they might have the best stuff that comes out of there because I can't believe they managed to mass-produce this type of guitar. These are... Very cool. The Ormsby Goliaths. Um, I don't know if you can see like how much I'm throwing that around. They're so, so this, lightweight. This one's the uh, color change as well. Yeah, that this one's like a cool. green to they blue are or green to purple. That was called chameleon. Chameleon. Yeah. So it's what is it? Green to purple. You see. I the think change. it's green to blue, but there's also a hint of purple in there. Yeah, that's totally cool. Although I'm really into this. I'm really into like this satin finish on these and the maple neck. You get lumen lay dot inlays here. I love the way they look on the maple neck because they have that sort of black outline as well. And you get the Ormsby logo on the on the 12th fret as well. These are these are Korean guitars. These aren't these aren't custom shop. These aren't especially high end. These are like a factory model, which I think is crazy. Who else is doing who else is doing stuff like that? This is so cool. So Ormsby guitars owned by Perry Ormsby, who is a mate of mine, um, he uh, he does loads of cool stuff at NAM this year. He probably had one of the biggest, coolest events that happened at NAM because he had. Mm. Um, you were there as well. Jared Dines. Yeah, yeah. He made an eighteen-string. Uh, he made an eighteen-string guitar for uh, YouTuber Jared Dines, which was, of course, absolutely ridiculous. It was a stone-topped, real stone-topped eighteen-string guitar with Jared Dines uh, YouTube logo as the twelfth fret, which is Jared Dines' face. Um, as the as the logo on the probably what was the twelfth fret somewhere on somewhere on the on the neck of the guitar has he like because obviously we saw him it got revealed at Nam and he, the yeah. first time he'd seen it as well yeah has he done anything with it because I haven't seen yeah yeah I he think he's, he's done a couple it. of ah. a couple of videos of it um, Perry was sending me like build videos of the guitar as it was going as it was going it's it's just absolutely bonkers and yes like an eighteen string guitar is completely pointless but the fact is that Perry Ormsby is such a good luthier that he managed to build a functioning one. And when he's actually trying to make guitars that are good, this is the stuff that he's making. And they are absolutely brilliant. They really are light as well. Yeah, they're really yeah. lightweight. They're super cool. You know, they're they're affordable for being a, a fan fret, like a, you know, a multi-scale headless guitar. I don't think, I don't think there is much cooler out there at the moment in this sort of modern format. These guitars are great. So this is the part of the show where I challenge Joe to do different things each week. And this week I have challenged Joe to go down to the GAK store and find me a Gibson that's not a Gibson. Challenge Joe. So today I'm looking for a Gibson that's not a Gibson, which is a great shame because there are loads of really good Gibsons here. And does anyone do anything like Gibson that's half as good? In the throes of the 70s, even Fender tried to be like Gibson when they introduced the Starcaster. I mean, it's still Fendery, it's still a bolt-on, but it's essentially a big 335-y, Gibson-y type thing. But then, does it being a bolt-on make it not Gibson-y enough? 
Despite their recent foray into Fender-like body shapes, PRS surely are the most Gibson-y of all brands. Look at this, the Makati 594. It's basically a gold top Les Paul. But then PRS aren't really as rock and roll as Gibson. I don't know if there's anything a bit more rocky than this. Epiphone are like Gibson, but without being Gibson. They're even owned by Gibson. But what Epiphone do really well are the guitars that Gibson aren't doing at the moment, like the Lee Malia RD. Gibson aren't even doing an RD at the moment. It's one of the coolest models they do. But is there anything cooler? Nothing has usurped Gibson's control of the metal scene quite like the ESP Eclipse. Indeed, is there anything more metal than this guitar? It's just like a Les Paul, but with some awesome heavy metal style refinements. But is it a bit too metal? Is there something that's a bit more general purpose? So there are lots of things, obviously, that are trying to be Gibson's at the shop. But something that I think is a super cool alternative that is still retro and rock and roll and like, full of vibe and stuff was the Yamaha Revstar series. Um, now, the Revstar series is something that came out a couple of years ago and it sort of came out of nowhere for Yamaha. And I kind of feel like it was the start of Yamaha reinventing their guitar division. This instrument came out in loads of different series. There must have been, I don't know, five or seven different tiers of model, which was quite a lot. There were quite a lot, which I guess depends how you think of it, but it meant that there was something for everyone. There was like a 299 model, there's like, you know, an, a Japanese made sort of 1500 pound model. These ones are towards the top end, and I just think they've got such great premium features. They kind of, they remind me a bit of the old Yamaha SGs, um, okay. which were fantastic. And the Yamaha SGs were the coolest guitars ever, but you, they were so heavy, um, and they were so hard to actually gig with for a reasonable amount of time. Ooh. Yeah, right. this one is cool. Yeah, this is cool. It's only sort of loosely based on the SG. It's not not 100% but I love everything about this. I love the satin finish. I love the gloss speed stripes. I love the gold anodized scratch plate. I love like the the small dot inlays, the headstock, the way that they've started like pressing on their logo is like a circular coin badge now. I just think this is absolutely cool. Even like the brushed uh chrome hardware and these uh uh Yamaha guitar division uh, YGD logos on the pickups. Everything about this is super cool. Sometimes I expect Yamaha to just make stuff that's maybe a little bit soulless because they're such a big corporation, but I think this is so much vibe. It it kind of encapsulates a lot of things that I love about, about Gibson. It's a great guitar. Yeah, so we saw the, they released these at NAMM, the new colors, didn't the they? The new colors, yeah. Um, and I didn't actually get to play it. We had uh, some other guy demoing them. So I'm looking forward to having a little bit of a jam with this. So let's plug it in and have a listen. So another really cool thing turned up uh, recently, which we've mentioned before in, in some other videos. Um, and it's actually a question that, that me and Tom put forward to the guys at Line 6 when we were over there at NAMM. Yeah. Um, and it's the ultimate gigging solution for the Helix. Yeah, so a little while ago we, we mentioned, because it was really recent, a couple of weeks ago, yeah. Line 6 announced the introduction of their Power Cab series for Helix. And they've already got here, which is, which is pretty cool. So this is the Line 6 Helix Power Cab. The reason this is great and an ultimate solution for your Helix is because it now means you can plug your Helix straight into this cab, use the preamps off of the Helix and use the speaker in here. The reason that that's great is because before now, if you owned a Helix, you were kind of relying on the venues you play having a good PA system. 
which is which is fine but there are like lots of us are playing smaller venues and we don't want to not use helix because of that this is your solution to that so uh this is very much this is an frfr speaker um that has its own modeling software and it can imitate lots of different single 12s as well so it's got like vintage 30s green backs cream backs things like that so this kind of means that you can use the helix and this and it's an ultimate gigging solution that you can take anywhere which is pretty cool so another thing we saw at nam seems to be a bit of a nam fest today yeah that's um, that's true stuff's starting to land yeah true. we're far enough post nam stuff's starting to get here um, but another thing that we did check out was the uh, GT1000. The Boss GT1000. Look familiar, does it? Yes, it's Boss's foray into the world of uh, effects and amp processors all in one. This is the GT1000. Potentially a Helix and Headrush killer, but you'll have to decide that. It has some things that are very different about it to those. Uh, to those to, to the helix and the head rush although it might not look like it like it does it's actually a bit smaller yeah a little bit which is quite nice i quite like this i mean it has the same sort of lights you know the sort of the multi-colored primary colors that you see on the on the helix it and feels the quite head premium rush. as well like it feels well it's, sturdy it's really good yeah it's a really good piece of equipment i think the the thing that i that i think is most interesting is boss Boss don't ever follow trends, they they create them. And whilst this might seem like they're late to the party, this is quite a different piece of equipment to to what uh, what Line 6 and, and Headrush have been putting out. I think the crucial way that it differs is with the with the Helix, for example, you might choose a, a preamp, you choose a head, essentially, you choose a, a, a model of a head, and then you'll choose a cab that you want to run with this, whereas, Boss, rather than having sort of separate heads and cabs, they have gone for full packages. So you you will be if you're using one type of head, then that's coming with a certain type of cab, which is quintessential to that product. That might make it sound like you get less less choice, but there's a very good reason behind that. Now the the reason is heads and cabs, real world heads and cabs react with each other in certain ways the way the air moves through the cabs based on the way the power is being pulled there are those subtle nuances that you get with real world heads and cabs if you are creating if you if you have a fake head and a fake cab they're not really talking to each other so they're just some predetermined eq settings that exist now that can sound very good and it does sound very good obviously the helix has been massively successful but this the gt1000 is seeking to recreate all those subtle nuances between those real world heads and caps, which is why they've set it up this way. Okay, so as you can see with the GT1000, we have this lovely, really big screen that lets us know what's going on. Um, everything's really well laid out so we can see what uh, we can affect in our signal path. Um, but let's, uh, let's listen to some sounds because I think it's got, this thing has some killer tones. <laughs> Shoebox Challenge! 
So this is the shoebox challenge. Now this is basically where Joe has to guess which effects pedal I have inside of this shoebox. Exactly, so we have five pedals in front of us here. I know which five, I just don't know which pedals Mark's going to be plugging me into. He's gonna choose three, so there are two duds. And this week we're doing delays. Indeed we are. So I've got one plugged in, uh -huh. you don't know what it is. Um, so shall we turn it on? Turn up that volume. Here we go. Cool, so that's number one. Let's move over to number two. So, I got number two plugged in. Let's uh, turn it on and see what you think it is. all you get. Cool, number three. <laughs> Now, I'm expecting big things because you are Mr. Effects Pedals. You are the fountain of all effects pedal knowledge. This is definitely uh, harder than I thought uh, it was going to be, so. Genuinely, do you know what all three are? Well, I'm gonna guess. I'd be interested to see in the comments how many people have got these, uh, got these right as well, but I don't know about you, that first one, the, the delay tails on the first pedal were really dark, so I think it was something analog from here. The problem I've got is that the Anna Sounds Utopia delay is like an analog voiced digital delay, so I was like, man, is it gonna be that? And I was like, if he uses the Anna Sounds, I hope he turns the mod function on because then I'll, I'll be able to hear it. The same with the Carbon Copy, it also has that mod function. Now, nothing had, no pedal that was used had modulation on, but, I think that's just because Mark didn't use the modulation button or switch to make it easier for me. That one has to be analog. I reckon that's the carbon copy. The first one? Yeah. Do you want to know? Yeah. Oh, yes! Oh, come on! That is... Oh, oh. <laughs> Number one. All right, all right. I, I mean... expect nothing less. If you don't get all three, okay. like... <laughs> then... I'm just happy I got the first one, man. That's the, this is the first time we've done this game, and that's the first one. If I get nothing else right through the whole time that we keep this up... So now uh, I've got to kind of remember. Now the second one stumped me a little bit because um, actually outside of what you saw, Mark used a different pedal and then like was messing around with it and then he was like, oh, I'm gonna use something else. And I was kind of set on what that one was and so I was a bit thrown well, by we can, this we can, one. We can guess that as well if you no, want. No, no, that's fine, that's, that's fine. Let's leave it like this. Um, this one was super clean, I thought. And... <clears throat> I'm gonna keep this hidden from the audience. It was, well. it sounded, the tail sounded clean and really neat and really um, obvious. And it's that sound that, that's that been used like loads and loads throughout the years. So something that was a quintessential delay. The only thing that threw me off was at the end, uh, you like, you dimed um, the, the delay rate and it sort of almost went into feedback. 
and you cut it just before it did. But I was like, man, the, the pedal I thought it was doesn't really do that. So I'm gonna stick with what I think it was, although I could be wrong. I reckon the second one's the DD3. <laughs> do you wanna know? Yeah. Well, obviously I want to know. Oh no! <laughs> Like, that's thrown me all out. So I... it was the DD3, that one that, you know, I had a little play with for like 10 seconds and right. then I changed over to this. Right, okay, um... okay. Well, okay, that's okay because the re-echo is a copy of the DD3, so I'm kind of, that's, uh, I'm, I'm not too fussed. You're disappointed with yourself. I know, I, I am slightly disappointed with myself. Do I still guess the third one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the third one is slightly easier because obviously I know those those first two are out of the way, so it has to be the DD3, the Anasounds, or the Canyon. We all know that I didn't think it was the DD3 because I thought the last one was the DD3. The question is whether or not I change my mind because I'll admit, I thought the third one sounded super crystal clean, and so I thought it was this. I thought it was either the Re-Echo or the Canyon. But with the Canyon, it really depended on on what setting you put, because the Canyon's a Swiss Army knife. So um, I'm going to say Canyon for the third one. For the third one. <laughs> no! <laughs> it oh. Just proves that this is harder. Then, then, you know, because I thought you were going to get all these. Yeah, yeah. I thought and I, I think was you thought well. you were going to get all them. So it just proves that this is, you know, like when you're not manipulating it yourself. I never, ever thought that last one was going to be the Utopia because it was so clean. Mm. And the Utopia is like quite a dark sounding delay pedal. The Utopia is also my favourite like delay oh, pedal. I great. use it loads at home, so I'm surprised I didn't get any. So, well, one, one out of three. One out of three is... Is poor. Yeah, I know. Did you do any better? <laughs> so it turns out that Joe doesn't know his delays as well as he thought he did. Uh, and we also had a look at the GT1000 by Boss, which was absolutely cracking. And the Line 6 Power Cabs. Yep, and the, cool. the new Ormsby GTR Goliaths, which were absolutely splendid. If you like this episode, let us know in the comments below. And if you want to see more videos like this, then don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And we shall see you very soon. Ta-ta. That was a weird one. Cool. Why? All good? I did that. Oh, I did that. Yeah.